Well, we continue our series in 2 Corinthians, and today in this series called God of All Comfort, we are going to be looking in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. We just have a couple of weeks of remaining in our series, so if you're coming in late, you may want to check out our archives and uh, get caught up, but today, once again, it'll be sort of a standalone message, and certainly uh, you'll be able to follow. We're looking at chapter 11 and Paul is, uh, he's, he's severely concerned. He is concerned that this church, this Corinthian congregation, is going to be led astray. And Paul has some competition. I mean, there are some slick talkers, some smooth operators that are arguing. And they're arguing for a different gospel in some cases. They're trying to change the message and what is so dangerous about all of it is that they're very good thinking on their feet. They're very good at speaking publicly. And as they do, much like a Plato or a Socrates, they're good at philosophizing. They're good at sounding eloquent. And they can be very convincing. And so the Apostle Paul is concerned. He's concerned because when he has come to them to teach and to preach... He did not come to them with slickness of speech. He didn't come to them showing off his smarts, but instead with a very simple, straightforward gospel. And he's worried that others are coming in on the heels of his ministry trying to taint it. So today, you know, to be honest with you, to be candid, this chapter is one of the most personal chapters for Paul. I mean... You may at first glance think, well, wow, I'm watching Paul just sort of brag on himself in order to establish his ministry, compete with these others, and what's the point? Well, I hope that as we look at this, as we look at Paul bragging, and he even indicates twice that it's foolishness that he is engaging in as he brags, but he's doing it to make a point to shame them to shame them into paying attention to the true message instead of all this braggery that's going on over here among other so-called apostles who are really no apostles at all. So as we read this chapter together and look at it, remember the message of the Apostle Paul. Remember it in Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians because Paul's point today through this chapter, his point is that he's got the real thing. And all this other stuff is fabricated, it's counterfeit, it's religiosity, it's prideful, it's me-centered instead of Jesus-centered. And so here we go, we jump in, and Paul is deeply concerned. He says, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, <laughs> but indeed you are bearing with me. So Everything that Paul is about to say concerning this bragging, he knows that it's uh, idiotic, that it makes no sense, that in one way of looking at things, he's wasting his time because everything is dung next to knowing Christ. So for me to brag about my past and for me to brag about my accomplishments and for me to brag about my commitment and my dedication and my devotion as an apostle, he knows that it's almost a waste of breath. But here he's going to do it anyway because these Corinthians, they seem to be so impressed by all of these slick talkers who do a lot of bragging on their accomplishments. So he's going to play the game for just a little bit in this long letter. He's going to play the game to make a point. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. So he's starting with the idea that, hey, I want you for myself. I want you, church. I want you for myself. And he says it's a godly jealousy. What does he mean by, I'm jealous for you? Well, other people are coming in and stealing your joy and stealing the truth away from you and taking what I planted 
in terms of the gospel message, taking what I planted and seeking to rip it out of the ground so that there's no harvest. And so I'm jealous for you because I spent time with you. I invested in you. I cultivated you. I worked alongside you. My heart has been fully invested in your life. And I taught you this message. Jesus, Jesus, and nothing but Jesus. And now there are others who are coming in and saying it's Jesus plus who baptized you in water. Jesus plus circumcision, Jesus plus the law, Jesus plus your commitment and obedience, Jesus plus something instead of Jesus plus nothing. And so Paul is defending this and he's saying, I'm jealous for you. I handed you to one person, to Jesus alone, so that you could be the bride of Christ and not mess with this other teaching that you're getting over here from these slick talkers. You notice the word pure. He just used the word simplicity. They're abandoning simplicity. And now he's saying they need to be pure in Christ for that is who they are. They are pure in heart. So therefore remain pure in doctrine. They are pure in heart. Therefore remain pure in attitude and thought. And I'm not talking about lust versus purity here. Paul is talking about purity of the message. Keeping it clean, keeping it simple, keeping it straightforward. That you are righteous because of Jesus and make no compromise. You are forgiven because of Jesus and make no compromise. That's what he's saying here. Now he says it. I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. So you remember what happened to Eve, right? We all know the story from the Old Testament scriptures. But maybe, just maybe, we miss the nuance. See, growing up, when I heard the story about the Garden of Eden, I always imagined that snake sort of slithering up and snickering in their faces and saying, Don't you want to do something bad? Don't you want to do something evil? Don't you want to go off the rails and go independent and just do something openly evil and ugly? But that wasn't it at all. See, there would be no craftiness in that. There would be no slick talk in that. There would be no deception really in that. That would be being honest about sin. Sin is evil. Sin is bad. Sin won't pay off. But don't you think you want to sin? You see, that's not a very slick sales pitch. If you're going to sales pitch somebody and you want to win them through deceit, then you're going to spin things. And that's exactly what Satan did. He said, in the day that you eat of this, you will be like God. Do you see? That's the spin. You will be godly. You will be like God. In other words, you will be so full of morality and so full of goodness and so full of godliness, and so full of ethics, when you eat of this, wow, you will be just like the Creator. And they look, and they consider, and they imagine for a moment what it would be like to be the Creator, or to be very much like Him. Beautiful attributes. I'll take it. And so at that point, they go rogue, they go independent, but they were suckers for the sales pitch, not of an ugly looking sin, but of a godly seeming religiosity and ethics and morality. They were suckers for a sales pitch of lifeless religion. They lost life in the day they ate of it. They died and they were not like God in that moment. But you remember they were invited to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't the evil tree. It was the knowledge of good and evil. And today, if we're not careful, we say, I'll take Jesus for salvation and I'll take the knowledge of good and evil for daily living. 
I'll take Jesus for salvation and I'll take morality and ethics for everyday life. If we're not careful, we become suckers for the same sales pitch. And you better believe that these people that were coming to the Corinthians, they were not saying, please go out and sin with us. No, it wasn't that straightforward. The sin they were inviting the Corinthians to was many times not one of bathhouses and immorality that was open, but instead it was a religious sin. It was a spiritual looking sin. It was a self-improving looking sin. It was Jesus plus the law, Jesus plus circumcision, Jesus plus legalism. And so certainly some were pulled toward open immorality, but others were pulled toward open religiosity. And we need to see that both whether it's evil-looking or good-looking, it is still the wrong tree. It is not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that we're to be on, but the tree of life, life in Christ Jesus. And he is afraid that they are straying from the simplicity of that message. Jesus Christ, you are my salvation, you alone. Jesus Christ, you are my morality, you alone. Jesus Christ, you are my ethics, you are my way, you are my truth, you are my life, you are my everything, and you alone. That's the attitude he wants them to stay on. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, You bear this beautifully. We see three different fabrications. Tweak the name of Jesus. Change who He is. Change the message of Jesus. Change the message of spirituality. If it's not the Spirit of Christ, then let's say it's this plus this, or a foreign spirit, or a particular gift that we all must have, or a buzz of energy that we all must receive, or some sort of spiritual message that we all must imbibe in order to reach super Christianity, a second level, a second tier, a second experience, a second blessing, a second, and you fill in the blank. Sure, you can start with Jesus, but then let's have a different spirit added in and a different gospel added in. These sort of things were happening 2,000 years ago, and they're still happening today. For I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. Now here, I believe he's got a little bit of sarcasm in his pen. But even if I am unskilled in speech, yet I am not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way, we have made this evident to you in all things. So he's poking fun at what they've done. And here's what they've done. They have elevated humans. Uh, This person is a super apostle. Oh, have you heard this one? He is amazing. Have you heard this one argue? Have you heard this one debate? Have you heard this one speak? Let me tell you, this is the one. And even among the true apostles, they were arguing about who they got baptized by. You remember that? Oh, I got baptized by so-and-so. You got baptized by him, but he's not as eminent or prominent or as amazing as the one who baptized me. And they were looking to apostles as status symbols, much like many would look to saints. Perhaps you've known of people or movements that look to saints and they call Christians saint this and saint that and oh this is my saint my patron saint and this is the saint I pray to and this is the saint I look to and we begin to worship men instead of God this is exactly the sort of thing that the Corinthians were getting into and so Paul plays the game sarcastically he says I consider myself not in the least inferior. I I can hang. I can hang with these dudes. I'm on their level, right? That's what he's saying. And though I come to you not as a slick talker, I have all the knowledge to compete 
If I need to compete with you, Corinthians, do I need to compete with you? Are we really going to play this game? But what I am doing, I will continue to do so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. So we know that there are certain that were chosen as apostles. All of them saw Jesus our Lord face to face. Every single true apostle was once a disciple or the apostle Paul who met with Jesus on the Damascus road and then was in the wilderness with him for many years. And then went up to the other apostles and said, is what he taught me in the desert the same thing that you've learned from him? And indeed, they agreed. But now we're seeing, you know, years and decades later, the message starts to be tweaked and twisted and warped. And now it's a totally different message. And people are running around calling themselves apostles. Do you know that there are people today calling themselves apostles? On Facebook, there's apostles on Facebook. And so when they try to friend you, and it's apostle so-and-so, you know, when they try to friend me, I think for a minute, well, i got to be careful. I mean, this is an apostle. Do you block an apostle? <laughs> Do you unfriend an apostle? I don't know. That's serious business. No, but Paul says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And that is the criteria, time spent face to face with the Lord, tutored and mentored by him. And he called some as disciples who then turned to apostles. And the apostle Paul was included in that. He called himself one untimely born. He didn't hang out with the historical Jesus before the resurrection, but after the resurrection, he was tutored by the resurrected Christ in the desert for many years. And so, you see here though, there is another group. There is a fabricated group of false teachers and apostles who are really no apostles at all, and Paul is saying, what I'm doing right now, this bragging thing, this laying down the ground rules of who is an apostle, I actually, I'm going to keep doing it and I'm not going to let up. I'm, I'm going to double down on this one because I am not going to give them an opportunity to brag about their flesh and brag about their self-effort and brag about their dedication and commitment and claim to be wielding a message that is really a message of death. There is only one message of life in Christ, and that is, by grace, you are saved through faith in Jesus alone, and there is no compromise. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. Man, that is just not a nice thing to say, Paul. But you see, he's not interested at this moment and being nice. We've caught him. We've caught Paul in a particular moment. He's happy to be sarcastic. He's happy, happy to be adamant. He's happy to be forceful. He's happy to be straightforward. And he's happy to call a spade a spade because it needs to be done. No wonder, no wonder they're false, no wonder they're fake, no wonder they're disguised, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Watch out for things that look good. Not everything that looks good is God. Oh, I received a message from God. How many times have you heard that? Maybe it's come from your own lips or the lips of someone you know. I've received a message from God. At that point, you want to hit the pause button and just say, wait a minute. Let's see if that jives with what the apostles brought us in the scriptures, let's see if that fits with the message of the gospel and we'll test it. There are no new messages. God is not sending out a new message or a new gospel or adding to the gospel. The book of Revelation ends this way. It says, let him be accursed. Whoever is adding or taking away from this let them be accursed. There is no adding. There is no second book. There is no second revelation. There is no 
extra gospel. Yet today, what do we see? Today, we see some religions of the world saying, I'll take the Bible and I'll also take this. I'll take the Bible and I'll also add in this. It was happening back then and it's happening today. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness whose end will be according to their deeds. That means a few things. First, it could be heinous, sinful deeds. And if you remain in Adam, your deeds remain unforgiven. You remain spiritually dead. And of course, your end will be according to your deeds. But it could also mean not just those ugly looking deeds, not just those heinous looking sins, but it could also be over here the pride and the religious arrogance and the assumption that by your deeds, somehow you're going to get right and stay right with God. And that's a lie. That's a lie of the enemy. Many people reach out to us by email or by social media And they want to know if they're still okay. They started with Jesus. I got righteous by Jesus. I got forgiven by Jesus. But I've had a divorce. Am I still okay? I've had a divorce and I've remarried. Am I still okay? I've committed the same sin 50 plus times. Am I still righteous? Am I still forgiven? Or did it run out on me? Do you see, if we're not careful the message can be covered over. It's not clear. Things become murky. Did you get right with Jesus because of your marital status? No. You got right with Jesus because of the death and resurrection of Christ. Did you get right with Jesus and stay right with Jesus because of the choices you make? That would be a works righteousness. Look, we're all about good works. Christ is good works. We're all about fruit. It's fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit causes us to bear fruit. But let's not get out here and worship the product. You know what a byproduct is, right? It's something that happens on the side. It happens as a result of a process. There's a process and then a byproduct. Well, God wants us to understand the process. But too many of us, we see a little bit of byproduct and we get over here And we put our our confidence in the byproduct. Well, that happened once, so I guess that needs to happen. And in fact, it needs to happen to stay right with God. And we get our eyes off of the process, who is a person, and we get our eyes on a product, which is simply fruit-bearing, and we start to lose our confidence, and we lose our peace, and we lose our stability. How did you get into this thing to start with? How did you get in Christ? Did you say, Jesus Christ, I am going to behave so well such that I am saved? You were saved. If you have Christ living in you, Christ came to live in you because you agreed that it was His behavior, His his death, His resurrection, His behavior that caused you to be right, not your behavior. So when we ask about our behavior and wonder if our behavior has lost us some sort of status with God, then we have changed systems, we have switched doctrines, we have started with Jesus, and now we're trying to finish some other way. And so some of these people started the wrong way. They didn't even start with Jesus. And he says... Their end will be according to their deeds. But if you started with Jesus, the Bible says, just as you received Him, so walk in Him. Continue the same way you started. Well, this second half, there's a lot of braggery here, and we won't study it as much as read it. But Paul says this, Since many boast according to the flesh, I'll play that game with you. Check this out. I'll boast also. In whatever respect anyone else is bold. Now, wait a minute. I just want you to know I'm being ridiculous here. I'm speaking in foolishness here. Give me a minute. All I need is a minute, and then I'll get back to sanity. (laughs) He's saying here. Am I just as... I am just as bold myself. Are they Hebrews? So am I. That tells you something. Who, Who are these tricksters? They're Jews. They're Judaizers. They're pushing Moses. Are they Hebrews? So am I. 
Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. What have they got on me really? Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane here because I would have to be insane to say they're servants of Christ. I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. No, but Paul, you don't understand. It's a, it's a gospel of prosperity. <laughs> Try that on the Apostle Paul. The author of more New Testament letters than anyone else. Oh, but God will always give you victory. <laughs> In your circumstances, everything will be smooth. Now, I'm not saying everything can't be at peace inside. But look at the Apostle Paul. And even inside, there are some emotions swirling around inside this dude. Check it out. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers. I explain that one, I don't know. Maybe standing in the river, just overwhelmed by the current. Dangers from robbers. Dangers from my countrymen. Dangers from the Gentiles. Dangers in the city. Dangers in the wilderness, on the sea and among false brethren, who would rather Paul have a little accident so that their ministry could continue without an impediment. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. You see what he's saying? He's saying, oh, and uh, hey, Corinthians, uh, what was it you were saying about those other guys? Because I forget. Oh, they're good at talking? Oh, that's interesting. You see it? He's defending his apostleship. He's showing the commitment and the dedication and the links to which he has gone to bring the purity of this message. Apart from such external things, internally, there's the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Imagine being a pastor of pastors. Imagine being a pastor of many churches, a traveling apostle having to sort of manage the early church among the Gentiles in many cities. Wow. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The God and the Father of the Lord Jesus he who is blessed forever knows that I am not lying. And here's the grand finale. I would have done it differently. I, I would have done it differently. But here's the grand finale. In Damascus, the ethnarch under Aretas the king was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me. And wait for it. I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall, and so escaped his hands. Now, I would, have, I would have ended with that whole tortured, nearly killed thing, but he, he ended with letting down in a basket, which is fine. He can do it that way. But you see what Paul has done. He has listed out danger after danger and circumstance after circumstance in order to show he cares deeply for these Corinthians. He has earned the right to be heard by them. And he has earned the right to be corrected by them because when they go astray following this nonsense, they need correction. Boasting is necessary, though it is not really profitable. Next week, we're going to see a little more bragging. He's not done. He's going to talk about visions being carried up to the third heaven, which is a spiritual heaven, seeing things that no other man has ever seen. And then we're going to talk about what it means for him, given all of that revelation, to walk quietly in humility, not bragging. So what did we see today from the Apostle Paul, from his attitude, 
from his sarcasm, from his passion as he writes with a pen. There is one gospel, not many, and it is freeing. There is one message, and it is worth defending, even if it means not being nice all the time. And there is one Jesus, and we need to know that he is good. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we are saved by faith in Jesus, by faith alone. Father, we thank you for the death and resurrection of Christ. We thank you that we can open the door, receive you, and be saved forever. And it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem religious. It doesn't seem like what we would invent as men. We would invent some system where we impress you. We would invent some system where we earn and achieve and sustain and maintain. But Father, we renounce all of that. We renounce those messages. We renounce those second spirits or second messages or second gospels or additions to what you've given us. We renounce all of that and we focus our attention on the simplicity of Jesus plus nothing. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his death, his resurrection. We thank you that it is so simple because we are sheep and we need it simple. We are children and we need it straightforward. We thank you, Father, for the purity of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.